Good morning and welcome everybody and those on the live feed. At a recent wedding, the pastor asked, do you take this woman for your wedded wife? The minister asked the nervous bridegroom, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness or just a minute, pastor, interrupted the bride. Stop now or you'll talk him right out of it. <laughs> okay. Fly and youth group meet tonight at 6.30 here. And I understand they're going to Dairy Queen. Felrel will have a meeting right after the service today in the parish hall. So if you were one of the newly appointed people, they have a meeting right after the service. Next Sunday is Mission Festival, and at the noon meal, meat and potato salad, not potatoes and salad, it's potato salad, will be, and drink, will be furnished. So if you want to bring something other than that, uh, that'll be fine. Jennifer? Good morning. Um, just wanted to share a little update on the backpack program. Um, I was asked last week if I knew an estimate of how much it costs for the green bags to go home on a weekly basis. Uh, we started the program again and we have handed out 45 um, current green backpacks that go home every Friday to the students. Um, kindergarten all the way through high school. Um, the program is truly funded solely on um, donations, monetary and food-wise. Um, I can tell you that we've had approximately 25 new students um, in the grade school, and the paperwork has gone home with him, them this last week. Parents need to sign off on that, that it's okay that they receive the backpacks. So um, the number was 45 this last Friday, and I have a feeling it will go up um, probably in the 50, uh, 50 number range. Um, they did some figuring as far as um, the grocery bill, and they've come up with an estimate um, around $7 a week uh, per bag. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of how much money is needed for the school year. Um, if it's a long weekend, the backpacks are a little fuller, and then they do boxes twice a year. So I think it's Thanksgiving and Christmas. And um, some families have three or four students um, that receive a backpack, but when they get the boxes, it's just one box per home. Um, as opposed to the green bags. If they have you know, three or four students in a family, each one of them get their own backpack. So I hope that sheds a little bit of light as far as um, the cost for the backpacks. It's a very much needed um, program, and we're blessed that we can continue it again this year. So um, within the week, I'll be placing the tote again in its place out in the um, foyer, and then I'll also provide the list of the food that they um, request easy to prepare food for the kids. Parents don't need to um, fix you know, whatever's in their backpack. The kids can do it themselves. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Jennifer, <clears throat> can you tell us um, how many weeks is there that those go out, do you know the total number of weeks, by chance? 36, okay. So if you're figuring that, you guys can figure the cost then of what it would be total for the year. If you just crunch those numbers, you can realize that. And then Dennis, I kind of wanted to clarify, is that, so are you guys taking the potatoes and adding them to the salad? <laughs> just checking, right? new concept. Oh, okay, all right. Well, we welcome you this morning. We're thankful for you to be here. The only announcement that I have is that, uh, that you would please keep uh, 
Jill Sheriff's uh, father in your prayers. He had a mild stroke the other day, and so uh, is he back from Carl yet? He's still there, so they're still, he's still being monitored, and, and um, he was having some problems getting his, was it his right leg or left, yeah, right leg to move. Um, and so I think that that might be, uh, it could be something that's permanent or it could be something that, that is going to be short term. But in any case, if you guys could pray specifically for those few things for him um, and that, that he would be able to get home soon and, and come home with a full recovery if possible, if that be the will of the Lord. So let's keep him in prayers. Are there any other announcements that need to be made that I have not made? Well, before we begin, I just want to get my tie nice and straight. All right, we begin the service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our call to worship this morning is responsive reading that's found on page 146. So if you would turn there or follow along if it's on the board. And it's Psalm 146, and that is definitely not... On page 146, it's on page 137. I should read what I'm doing better. All right, Psalm 146. And I decided to do this as a responsive reading because obviously it's in there as a responsive reading, but uh, sometimes as we engage ourselves as we're reading responsively and we're uh, trying to say these things in unison, even sometimes when we struggle with it, we're able to resonate with the words. And I found that Psalm 146 this week was... uh, something that I resonated with and and, and appreciated, so hopefully you will as well. So the congregation will read the bold. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Do not trust in princes, in mortal man, in whom there is no salvation. How blessed is he who help is the God of Jacob, whose help is in the Lord his God. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord protects the strangers. He supports the fatherless and the widow, but he thwarts the way of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. Thy God of Zion to all generations. Praise the Lord. Please join me in opening prayer. Lord, we are grateful for you this morning. We're grateful, Lord, that that you are the stronghold of the oppressed. And Lord, we are often oppressed in so many different ways and everyone has a specific trial or struggle that they might be going through that you know us so well. You know every situation in our life. You know us better than we know ourselves. Lord, we're thankful that you are on our side, that you are not against us, but that you are for us, that you are not our enemy but that you have become victorious over our enemy. Today, Lord, we come before you humbly, knowing our lot apart from you and our desperate need for everything that you have to give. Lord, we accept you. We praise your holy name. We shout your name on high. We lift you up, for you should be glorified. For great is your mighty name. Amen. Let's sing together, if you would please stand and rise. Our opening hymn, This Is My Father's World, 191.
Today we're going to sing our confession of sin, and um, during the declaration of grace, I'm, I'm going to approach it a little bit different this week, but let us confess our sins by singing the hymn at Calvary, number 533, and as we sing that, I pray that that would be your heart's cry then, that through the singing of this hymn, you recognize the need for forgiveness in your own self and, and the call to Christ then to forgive. Let's sing together that 191, or sorry, 533. I find the line in that last song that pardon there was multiplied to me. You ever wonder if the pardon was enough? Well, it wasn't just given, but it was multiplied, right? More than enough. One of the things that I was thinking about this last week as I thought about the Declaration of Grace and, and the one that I specifically use often and the one that I appreciate the most of the ones that we have within our, our hymnal. And... I've known every time that I've used this declaration of grace that it's founded on Scripture. But sometimes I take for granted what I know and what others might know. And I assume that everybody would know the truths of what are found in this declaration of grace. Well, maybe we're not familiar with some of the verses that these truths come from. And so today, what I would like to do is, as I say the declaration of grace, I'm going to Read the scripture from which we can stand on that these sentences come from. So let us begin. If this be your sincere confession, and if with petent hearts you earnestly desire the forgiveness of your sins. For this, let's look to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 through 14. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's palace and successfully completed all that he had planned on doing in the house of the Lord and in his palace. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon 
at night and said to him, I have heard your prayers and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. For the sake of Jesus Christ, God, according to his promise, forgives you all your sins. Be reminded then of Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. And all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. John chapter 17, verses 1 through 2. The beginning of Christ's prayer in the garden. Jesus spoke these things and lifted his eyes up to heaven. And he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh. That to, whom all, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life lastly first john chapter 1 verse 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and by the authority of god's word and by the command of our lord jesus christ i declare to you from john chapter 20 verses 19 through 23 So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. That God, through his grace, has forgiven all your sins. We begin with Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. And Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. For he rescued us from the dam, the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And Galatians chapter 2, verse 16 and then 20. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we having believed in Jesus Christ, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, 
I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And lastly, amen. From Psalm 106, 48. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting even to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. I'll call on the scripture reader at this time. The Old Testament lesson this morning is found in Isaiah chapter 29, verses 17 to 24. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field, fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease. And all who watch to do evil shall be cut off. Who by a word make a man out, of, out to be an offender, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate. And with an empty plea turning aside him who is in the right. Therefore, thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed, no more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands is in his midst, they will sanctify my name. They will satisfy, sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. And who, those who go astray in spirit will come to undeserved. Uh, to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction. And the epistle for today is 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 11. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything that is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters of, on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more, more glory? For if there is glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must, be, must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Here ends the reading. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. The gospel text is Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. And then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephethreta, this is, be opened. And his eyes, his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealous they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Here ends the reading of God's word. If 
if you find yourself sometimes pondering uh, Scripture over the week and praying over different things, maybe spend some time wondering, Christ, who knew all things, knew what would come, still asked them not to spread the word, knowing that they would spread the word. And what purpose then would he say, knowing it would not work? If I was going to tell somebody to do something and they weren't going to do it, maybe I wouldn't say to them to do it. Contemplate that. Let us confess our faith now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll call on the children at this time for the children's message. Oh boy. Are you excited, James? All right. What do we got in here? Seems like it might be fluffy. You can see through the bag. Oh, I thought it was the alligator. I had all planned out my whole children's message because I thought he brought the alligator. But instead, he brought the snake. Ooh, isn't this fun? So, what's this for right here? Should I stretch out the, the, the mouth so it, his hand doesn't fit in it anymore? So this snake can do what? Oh, well, he's a puppet. He can bite. Yeah, you could use it to bite. But what does he do? He's really biting his tongue. Hi, Brinkin, how are you? Is, what is he doing? Talking. Talking. Now, I I'm, I'm was the voice of the snake, but he was talking, wasn't he? Yes. Do snakes talk? Are you sure? Well, that's kind of like talking. They talk with their teeth if they bite you. That's kind of like talking, but not really. When we talk, what are we doing? We're communicating, right? We're using our words to express what? An idea or a thought, right? Now, snakes can't do that, right? They can't express in words, in a language, what they think. However, who was it who said one did talk? Brecken, did you know? Guys, did you know that there was a snake once that talked? Now, how many of you, if you guys were walking around in the forest and saw a snake, would run the other direction? Because that's me. One time I was fishing, and there's these snakes. They're called bull snakes, and they look like a rattlesnake. And in Colorado, they have rattlesnakes. And what they look like a rattlesnake, and then they shake their tail like a rattlesnake, but they don't have a rattle, but then they use their mouth and it sounds like a rattlesnake. So here I am fishing, having a great time, and I'm walking down. And at that time, I didn't have a cool tie on, but I was walking like that, right? And I'm having fun, and I step on a snake. And the snake was about this big around, okay? Because I could feel it under my foot, and I heard it rattle. Do you want to know how I ran? 
like this. <laughs> Trying to get my feet out of the way just in case it was a, a rattlesnake that wanted to strike at me. And then when I got far enough away, I looked and I looked and I saw him go down to the water and saw his tail and realized it was a bull snake. But if you're walking around and all of a sudden a snake came up to you and started talking, whoo, that might be scary, right? Well, one snake talked and he talked to a person. He talked to Eve. And everything that he had to say was against or questioning what God had told Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve were told what? Isaiah, what were they told? No, <laughs> we're not sure it was an apple. What was it? Okay, what was the forbidden tree? There's a specific name of it. Okay, yeah, the knowledge of good and evil. They were not supposed to eat from that tree. But the snake, the, and what, did, what was God's punishment? What would happen if they ate from the tree? Eternal death. Well, <laughs> thank you for interpreting it for us. They're not supposed to eat of it because God said you will surely die, right? And what does the snake say? Oh, there's no way you'll really die. Is that really true? You see how I'm making fun of the snake kind of? Eh, like that, and I used a condescending tone. I'm, I'm doing that on purpose. So then she believed him. Well, man, I, probably I won't really die. But what was that death? It was, it was the fact that they sinned, and then you said a spiritual death, right? Because their bodies, did they die right when they ate the apple? Were they like, ugh? Did they have X's in their eyes on the ground? With their tongue hanging out like they do in cartoons? No, they didn't die like that. What happened to them? It'll happen to you when you turn 18. <laughs> Smart man. They had to move out of the garden. God kicked them out. Said, that's your punishment. Go to work. Well, they got separated from the presence of the Lord. And it's because of that sin that that sin has been passed on down and down and down. And did you know that that sin has been accredited to you? All because somebody listened to a snake. Bad idea, isn't it? So who should we listen to, a snake or the word of God? Word of God. There we go. Hands out. Good job. Together. Lord, we're thankful for you. Lord, and in spite of our foolishness, we're thankful for your grace. Because most certainly, the sin of Adam and Eve has been accredited to us, for we are their descendants. But thank you that you've saved us from this. Help us to listen to you and not the world or the snake in the grass, but to hold tight and stand on truth of your scripture. In your holy name, amen. All right, let's see who we're going to give this out to now. Who's had it? James has had it, so he can't. Aiden, are you going to be here next week? All right, we're going to give it to Aiden. So what you're going to do, Aiden Allen, yeah. So what you're going to do is you're going to put something in here, and then I'll do a Sunday school lesson on it. So you can pick anything, and the goal is to try to stump me. So you're going to try to pick the hardest thing you can think of that would be the hardest thing to do for a sermon, okay? All right, good job, guys. Go have a seat. Here, James.
Well, good morning. So we are in Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 6. And we go through verse 8. We're on the second day of creation. So let us begin. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Let's pray. Jesus, there are so many things that you long for us to know that is revealed in your scripture. Not only just information, but hidden within it, your love for us. Today, Lord, we pray that you would reveal your scripture to us in such a way that your love be explained and seen, that even we might feel it, Lord. We might hear it. And Jesus, in it, give us the strength and the heart to believe it. And in these places, when we look through this creation, we know, Lord, that it, that it takes faith in you to fully grasp it, or not even to be able to fully grasp it, because we can't fully grasp it. So, Lord, be with us as we hear from you in your word today. And may I not be the hindrance, Lord, but you go forth mightily. In your holy name, amen. So, are there many beaches around here? You guys grow up in the beach at all? Now, some of you guys like to take vacations, so you've been on beaches, but do you guys remember building sandcastles on the beach? Did any of you do that ever? And I've never seen the ocean, but we did have, you know, sandy beaches at Loveland Reservoir. And uh, I remember building sandcastles. And, and one of the things about building a sandcastle was that if you weren't careful and the waves were coming, that they would come and they'd wash over the things that you had built. And so even, even when you build something out of sand, even when the professionals build something out of sand, right? Some big castle or different kind of animal or whatever they do that if it begins to rain, right, it'll wash it away. It's not something that can be permanent that will last forever. It's kind of like an ice sculpture, right? Eventually it will melt if, uh, if it's ever taken into a higher temperature. So today we look at this expanse. And, and I kind of find it interesting because it seems like the least amount of thing was done on day two. Right? All he did is made some space. That's kind of what it, what it sounds like. And yet it was devoted to one full day. And I kind of was like, man, he didn't do a whole lot that day. You know, the next day he does all this other stuff. You know, day four, he's doing all kinds of stuff. And so you go, he just, he just made an expanse. So, but there's a lot to be said in that. And at first I was like, I'm going to have to kind, you know, I'm going to have to combine this day and this day together just so I have, feel like I have something to talk about. And, but I began to read a little bit about what Martin Luther has to say. So one of Martin Luther's best works is his commentary and his work on Genesis. And I was reading some of the stuff that he had talked about. And right now, currently, we're going through this section in uh, Fly on Satan, angels, and demons, right? And there are several commentaries that talk about this particular thing, where he says here, let us separate the waters from the waters. And he called that space heaven. And I talked a little bit mentioned it last week, right? So this word for heaven in the, in the Hebrew language is kind of very, and their understanding of it, is kind of very vague. It, it's very broad. It, it includes the space, in a sense, from 
the air we breathe currently up through our atmosphere and yet still includes the area where the stars exist. And so you go with, with our knowledge, which is different than what Moses or yeah, Moses' knowledge would have been when he's writing this, uh, is, is different. At least our, our scientists feel like that they can give you distances in light years from, you know, from one planet to another or from one solar system to another, which I, quite frankly, it's hard for me to... We don't understand gravity, right? Like, we understand that it exists and somehow they can measure some magnetic pull of gravity... But in reality, we can't replicate it, and we don't know where it comes from exactly. And yet we think we can tell the distance in light years from here to the next solar system. I'm not quite convinced that we're 100% accurate on that. However, it's still different than our idea of what Moses would have understood. So, so when you think about it, Sometimes we use the word heaven, and way, the way we use that word in our English language is to include that place in which God dwells, right? The place that we go to, the great by and by. And yet when you look up Scripture and you, you begin to uh, think of that place of heaven, it's called different places, right? In the one parable of the rich man and Lazarus, it's called Abraham's bosom. And Abraham is there. And then in other places... It's called the temple, right? In, in uh, Isaiah, the train of his robe filled the temple. So was he in the temple, in Solomon's temple, when he had that vision? Or was he in God's temple? And then in Revelation, we see the vision of, of, of Jesus in the temple and his glory. And it talks about the sea of glass that was before him. And so there's these different pictures that we get throughout scripture of heaven but what we don't always get and i don't believe it's counted anywhere is how did it come to be so some commentaries will take this word for heaven here and say that it does not include the place in which we think of that idea of heaven where the heavenly hosts dwell where we will go in the great by and by they say that it's specifically and only just this space that is what we would consider our atmosphere and the beyond. And yet there is no account then anywhere in Scripture of the heavenly hosts being created. It doesn't talk about when did God create angels? When did God create Satan before he fell. There's only pits and pieces of things that we see elsewhere, and those pieces are prophecies that can be bifolded or twofold, where they are to a specific kingdom on earth and yet can be included into a picture of Satan as well. So it's kind of complicated. And one of the things that Martin Luther will say is that we have to be careful here, right? We don't want to impose our ideas onto Scripture. So there are all kinds of ideas about how angels came to be and what they're like and what they do and, and all those kinds of things and, and uh, how they were created and uh, the story of how and what happened during the fall. And Martin Luther would say, be careful what you impose. And so as I was thinking about that, I, I go, what's the purpose then of taking one full day to talk specifically just about the expanse? Well, remember in the last day, in the very first verses of Genesis, that it talks about that, that the earth was formless and void. And that was the idea of this. It's just chaos. There's no shape. There's no form. There's nothing. It was just there. And so then when he makes the expanse, he creates form where there was no form. He begins to shape when there was no shape. 
the reality of the significance of this is beyond one sermon. So I would like to take three weeks. No, I'm just kidding. No, but, but for a moment, think of this. Because we talked about out of nothing, we had the something. And what we recognize today is that from chaos, from disorder, God creates order. How many of you uh, are interested or have been interested ever, maybe watched a documentary or something like that, on, on Moses and the crossing of the Red Sea? Anybody ever watch those? So there was the one that they had where they went and they, they thought that they knew exactly where Moses must have crossed. And in order to prove that, they had to find some kind of evidence. And what the evidence that they were looking for were then the chariots, right? Because Pharaoh goes into the place where and follows them, and the Israelites are through, and Pharaoh's almost there, and the waters crush and kill. Well, if they were being chased by chariots and horses, there must have been some kind of evidence left on the bottom of the floor of the, of the sea that would indicate those things. So they began to look. And do you know what they looked for? In order to know the difference between just the sea floor and something that existed that was made, created, engineered, do you know what they looked for? Shape. Because shape indicates intelligence. Shape indicates intelligent design. It shows ingenuity. It shows engineering. A triangle, right? Uh, if you think of a bridge that you might cross, you recognize that it's been designed to carry and load the weight. And when you look at it, you see shape. So they look for shape, and they suppose they found something that looked like a wheel spoke, so they got excited, though it's hard to tell if it really was that. The same thing goes for any kind of expedition under and in the sea. Anytime they're looking for a shipwreck, everything they're looking for are lines and shapes. Because there is order when things are created. There's form. In this day where, so we have this water that's shapeless and God creates the expanse and gives shape to the earth. He takes what was chaos and he brings it to order. All in one word, right? Firmament or expanse. When we look at, and, and I spent some time talking with Steve about this a little bit, right? Some of this is called apologetics that I'm talking about now, right? How many of you have had somebody come up to you and ask you the question, well, how do you know God really exists? How do you know that the scripture is true? How, how can you stand on those things and know, because I don't believe that scripture is true. When so, if, if somebody were to say that to you, what, what would you say in response? What would be your burden of proof? Though I don't believe God needs a burden of proof, because I think God has clearly made himself evident. Now, you guys did the catechism study, right, Steve? You guys went through the catechism, right? <laughs> Question 119 in, in the explanation of our catechism asks this very question and then gives ways that, that we discuss this question and how we support it. The problem that we have today when we think of apologetics is that when we ask this question, how do you know, is that we are standing on Scripture as Christians by which we should, but we're using Scripture to defend our faith. And the thing is, is the person that we're talking to or defending our faith to doesn't believe in that scripture. 
So their response after we say something that is based in Scripture is, so what? I don't believe in Scripture. And so what we must do then is take our Scripture that is truth and connect it to the other things that are truth in our world that can't be denied. On day two though it can be found on day one, God does that again. And I give you an example, and I'm going to pick on a student. Hannah, last week I said I wouldn't pick on you yet, just so you know. So I'm not going to pick on you today. Are you excited about that? Did your, did your heart stop a beat for a second? Yeah. Brecken. Weston just threw Brecken out from underneath the bus right now. Okay, we'll try Brecken. Brecken, are you ready? Okay. Brecken, if you're walking on the beach and you walk across and you see a watch, what does that indicate? By the way, I've used this exact terminology in class, so this isn't something new for them. This is something they should have remembered. Yes. Oh, he's good. So he actually is listening when he's messing around. What it shows is that there was somebody who created the watch, right? Because like, how many of you have been walking across anywhere and seen a watch and were like, oh, <laughs> that must have just come together right there. No. Have you ever taken a look at the inside of those old school watches and all the gears and all the little wheels that work together and you can see that it was designed and purposed to work together? Let's take it a step further. For those of you who aren't old and don't remember watches and are really young. So what kind of TVs do we have today? By the way, when I grew up, it was this really fuzzy black and white thing with these weird ears that had to have foil wrapped around them in order to get them to work right. What kind of TVs do we have today? Levi, what kind of TVs do we have today? Are they big? Are they bright? Are they thin? Yeah, he's like, I don't know. Were they thin before? What do you think it takes for a signal, something that was created over here, a picture taken, motion picture, video, taken over here, inputted, and somehow gets all the way over here and projected onto my TV? How many of you would watch TV and just be like, yeah, evolution took care of that. It all just came together. After the big bang and the TV, boom, right there. It was able to, signal came across the waves and all of a sudden there's pixels and colors. Sounds ludicrous, doesn't it? That's because it is. Because nobody would look at a TV and not think somebody created that TV. Because it has form, it has shape, it has purpose, it has design. The basics, right, of God. One of the basic things thing that he does is he takes the nothing and creates the something. He takes the chaos and makes order. He brings form where there is no form. And so he shapes in one word the foundations of the world and the heavens. How many of you, as you live, as you breathe, struggle with purpose in your life. I feel like that older generations might struggle with this less 
because they're more con- to, they're they're easily finding contentment in what they do, right? That's the difference between somewhat of the difference of why you have generations and Steve and Ken and Wayne and Dennis, uh, the you know even Troy, where you have people in your guys's generation. They started a job, maybe they changed once, but had that job for like 50, 60 years. Some of you still doing that job today, farming, right? Whereas you got people in my generation and lower, they work there for 10, 15 years, get sick of it, and decide to change careers just because they think they don't like it. They'll change. They're not content with what they have. They want something more. When we look at what God has done for us, as in this creation, we begin to realize that he brings form to what has no form. I can't tell you how many times in my life I woke up in the morning, I looked at myself in the mirror, and I hated who I was. And, and I don't say that lightly, right? I don't say that dramatically. I say it specifically And truthfully, I wanted to be more than who I was. I still struggle with that even today. It's something that that lives within me, and I'm sure that it lives within other people. Sometimes it's good for us because it strives us to do more. It strives us to work harder. It strives for us to be better. And yet, the problem is once we get there, we recognize that we still want more. And the purpose and the significance that we long for is not found in our accomplishments. Because we cannot bring order, we cannot bring form to our life. We can build, we can build, we can try, and then all it takes is one wave to come through and wash away the sandcastle that we've built and lay us bare before God in our helpless estate. Because we're not able to bring form to the formless. We're not able to bring purpose. Christ, God, this is the foundation of who he is, is to bring form and purpose. Where there was no purpose, where there was no form, think of your life Before it began. How many of you have seen pictures of babies in the womb? When they're really little, they're ugly. They look like an alien, beady eyes. Then they get cute, you know, as they get a little bit bigger. And God has created that life in the womb. From the moment of conception and life begins... When two different cells come together to create life, it begins. And as God has knitted and formed, out of the formless, he creates form in the mother's womb. That being said, who you are was designed a long time ago. For some of you, it was a really long time ago. Is Ron here? Oh, he didn't come today. I was going to, I told him the other day, I was, when we get to Noah, he's going to be able to relate since they, oh, he's over there. He is here. He's hiding behind Dennis. I told him the other day, we get to Noah, him and he's going to start having memories, you know, and remembering the time around a campfire with Noah and that kind of stuff. No, we know that, that it's even in that beginning stages. And God could not have created what he created on day three, day four, day five, and day six, if he didn't create what he created on day two. As the foundations begin, as where there was no form, form begins. The design begins. What did not make sense, what could not have been fathomed, but by God, 
began to take shape, knowing what would come on day three, four, five, and six. Thus, relate to your life from day two of creation. And recognize the purpose for what God has designed you for came long ago before you can even fathom or understand what you were or how you would be or where you were coming from. Before you saw light and breathed your first breath, God has designed you and given you shape and form for the rest of your life and intentions for you. What, what greatness that is. What wideness of love. What wideness of knowledge. What a great God can we serve. Oh, it's huge. Day two is much bigger and more important than we could ever think. For it's, it shows us the heart of who God, who God is. It shows us that, that we were not just something that evolved from another species. Evolution from molecules to man. We didn't come from monkeys. It wasn't a hap stance. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't some kind of weird reason. It wasn't natural selection. Boy, you have been selected. You have been chosen. You have been designed. Divinely. By the one true God. This is so. I know that as intelligent as I am, I'm not an academic, right? There are far more people much wiser and learned than I. And I remember watching this TV show. Maybe I explained this before here. This is one of my favorite illustrations. I was watching this, this TV commercial one day, and there's these two boys, okay, they're young kids, they're, they're twins or they're brothers, they're about the same age it looked like. And they're playing with that box that you put shapes in, right? And you remember that used to be, not the square ones, but the longer ones, right? So the round cylinder and a, you know, the long triangle. And so what they got there is they got the box out and they got a square peg and they're trying to put it in the round hole and they're making that baby fit. They got two hammers just wailing on that thing, getting it in there. And the end of it is splintered like this. You know, it's, they, they're trying to get it in there. And then the next picture you see, you see them working on a car, and you're like, ooh. <laughs> That's how I felt when I was in seminary. Every day in class, I felt, I felt like those two kids were just pounding onto my square peg trying to get me in this round hole. And I was splintering because I didn't fit in there. And I kid you not, the first day of my internship was like somebody had taken that round peg and dropped it right in a hole. Just slick, right, right in there. This is the difference between walking in what we've been designed and walking in what we think we are. When we walk in the will of God, what God has designed us for, what He has formed us to be, it's smooth, it's easy, because it's what God has designed you for, it's your purpose. When you're going against his purpose, it's going to feel like a peg splintered apart being forced in a hole that doesn't fit. God brings form where there is no form. He brings purpose where we cannot create it. This is what's found 
on day two. Let's pray. Jesus, we're not able, but we know that you are more than able. And as we recognize your superiority, not only in your divinity, but in the word of creation, as you were created for all things and through all things, knowing that one day even the sky can be rolled up, you are great and mighty. And the care that you took as you created, we know it's the same care and purpose as we were created. Lord, show us who we are in you. Show us where you wish for us to be. Show us our strengths and our weaknesses. And may we recognize that it's in you we move and have our being. What can we say to the one who gives all purpose and order, who gives me something to live for? You are great, and we love you deeply. In your holy name, amen.
Christ, we come before you in prayer and petition today. Lord, we think of those who could not make it here, who are shut in, Lord, who, who might be watching via the internet, but Lord, who would probably long to be here in spirit and, and in physical form. I think of Joanne this morning, Lord, I pray that you would be with her and that you would help her to feel better. I pray for Elaine and for Eunice. I thank, for, thank you, Lord, for both of them and, and for the strength in their families and what they mean to their family. I think of Harold this morning and, and those in Prairie View. I think of Bill Martin, Lord, and, and his son also as he works and is abroad, Lord, be with him and keep him safe. Think of Jill's father this morning, Lord. I pray that you would please be with him, that you would comfort him and that your spirit would rest on him, Lord. Bring your hand of healing. Lord, we all pray this morning for little Levi and for the struggle that he is going through. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would lift him up Please bring healing to him. But Lord, use his situation also to share the love of your gospel that you would be made known in other people's lives, that your word would be over their life, Lord, and surrounding them and that the people that come in contact with them and, the, and pray for him and all those things, Lord, that, that you would be there in the midst of that claiming who you are and in your truths. Be with all those who, uh, Lord, who are caregivers and who protect us and our country, protect us in our communities, keep us healthy when we're sick. And Lord, we ask that you would protect family, that you would keep Satan from destroying and separating father and mother and siblings. And Jesus, we pray that you would bring our nation back unto you, that the heart of who we are might know you. And in, in all that, we also ask that you would not tarry, that you would come back soon. And until then, Lord, may we be ready, may we be anticipating and eagerly awaiting your arrival. May we not be found wanting, but maybe be found waiting. We pray all these things. We pray the prayer, Lord, that you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. It comes from Romans chapter 11, verses 33. And 36. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's, uh, we conclude this service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's sing together our closing hymn, To God Be the Glory, number 509.